Coming up on this week's show, we look back on the best of 2022. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every Friday with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books you need to check out. We'll tell you more about this in just a bit. I'm Too Young to Die, The Ultimate Guide to First Person Shooters, 1992 to 2002, covering the early experimental years of the genre that went on to rule video games. We'll tell you more about that in just a bit, and you can check it out right now and the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay, who offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service, and they have low-cost, fast turnaround quality boards, and they do services like 3D printing and injection molding, and they're massive supporters of the retro community. So if you're working on a project over Christmas, you can get an instant quote right now at (laughs) PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 357, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for our end of year wrap-up show. And it still blows my mind. I mean, I'm looking out my window now at my uh, frost-covered street. I think it's currently like minus three degrees outside at the moment. So that means we've made it to the end of the end of the year. And this is the episode that we do every year, definitely not the filler episode. It's the one that looks back on all the best bits and celebrates the incredible guests that we've had on over the last 12 months. As uh, 2022, I think you'll agree, guys. I know the world's been a bit of a weird place again, and you know it's, it's tough going into winter, but I think in terms of this podcast, it's been an incredible year for us, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it's been the year that the kind of the physicalness of the podcast has come back and the community, which is really nice. You know, we've gone out to events around the world and we've seen and met people. And, um, you know, we just sit here and kind of put this out and re- record it every week. And seeing people really creates a, a nice vibe. And also having that community behind it, it's been great with the patrons chatting to everybody, but also the variety of guests that we've had on. We've had some, some guests that I've always wanted on the show and we've had some systems covered that we've never touched on before. Yeah, and we're going to be doing that this week. We're kind of going to look back on there. Uh, we picked five of our favourite little sections of interviews, and of course we'll put the the link to the full episodes in the show notes as well if you want to do a bit of binge listening over Christmas. And we've all picked out five of our favourite guests of the year and uh, a little bit of those interviews, so we'll play those in just a moment. But I think you're right. I mean, what a year it's been, 2022, the year that we finally got out to events again. And you actually uh, went abroad for an event for the first time this year, Joe, with us. Yeah, man. I uh, went to Norway to Retro Mesa with you guys, which is absolutely amazing and you know kind of cement what Ravi said this this year been a crazy year for us of all the stuff we've been doing but we've had some absolutely amazing guests so that is probably you know the big highlight for me Uh, but like you say retro Mesa and Norway you guys was just like a a bit of surreal like a dream come true kind of thing we we forced you to do a panel as well well every panel yeah yeah I did every (laughs) panel right in the deep end (laughs) yeah it threw me in the deep end uh, which was really cool you guys did Germany Amiga 37 didn't you yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to America as well, which was yeah. uh, crazy. VCF East. Yeah. Um, so, so we've been going around the globe, really. And actually, the events haven't finished. We do have one more, if you can get up to Nottingham this weekend. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be doing the first ever Nottingham Gaming Expo, aren't we? Yeah, that's that's going to be really interesting. That's going to be another panel. And um, we're hanging with the rare guys, and it's really nice because, um, you know, we've, we've got Graham Norgate there. Um, he's a Nottingham local. We've got um, David Wise, who's a Nottingham local as well. And uh, we've got Kev Bayliss joining us. And then on Sunday, uh, Simon Phipps is also going to be there with Core Designs, which is Derby. So it's kind of like an East Midlands show. And, you know, the Midlands, we, we've been missing these video game shows for a long time. Yeah. So it's it's good to see one being created in Nottingham. Yeah, so tickets are available for that if you can get up to Nottingham this weekend. It uh, starts tomorrow when the show comes out on uh, Saturday, December 17th. So I'll put a link to uh, get your tickets in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into uh, our celebration of the year, you mentioned the guys from Rare there, uh, Kev Bayliss, uh, David Wise, Grant Kirkhope is behind this as well. They got in touch to tell us about a, uh, a great little project that they're doing at the moment. They've actually just released a Christmas song. Oh, nice. Now, this yeah. is, yeah, let's get it to number it, one, guys. <laughs> Well, that's the aim. We're going to try and get this to number one. And, you know, we're all bored of Mariah Carey being number one every year, aren't we? Yeah. And uh, this is, it's for a really good cause as well. 
It's raising money for a charity called Special Effect that um, helped to make accessibility in video games for people with disabilities better. Oh, they're so great really special effects. I've seen loads of really good stuff about them. Um, and yeah, yeah, they're, they're about providing systems to people, but also, you know, stuff like the accessibility controllers and, yeah. uh, you know, bringing a bit of joy to people that uh, can't access games. So do you want to hear a bit of their Christmas song? Yeah, absolutely. This kind of reminds me a bit of like something Wizard or Slade would have done back in the day. <laughs> I want a video game for Christmas. Sounds better than Lad Baby, our local hero. <laughs> so this new song is called A Video Game in Christmas. It is on YouTube now as well. And if you want to get hold of it, obviously all the proceeds are going to the special effect charity. I'll put a link in our show notes at theretrohour.com. We've actually got a Christmas party coming up as well this weekend, haven't we? Well, it's <laughs> it's kind of just meet up and have a pizza. But I, it'll probably end up with a photocopier incidents and uh, madness <laughs> We've got to find a photocopier. <laughs> find a, running around town looking for a photocopier. Yeah, but um, we decided just to get together and have a little Christmas celebration. And also to celebrate our book as well yeah so I'm, I'm thinking that i'm gonna have to play a video game of christmas on my phone while joe like dances around christmas tree in the middle of nottingham on our table be good for oh, that, yeah. that sounds like a good idea <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean the, another big highlight of the year just before we get into the clips of course uh, can we just say a big thank you because um is the first episode that we've recorded since our book was successfully funded and we smashed that stretch goal last weekend at uh, saturday night i was actually away with the family we got like um a place in Buxton up in the Peak District because it was my birthday and the father-in-law's birthday. So we're away and uh, we've been out watching the England game because, you know, my, my father-in-law's really into football. So we've been in the pub for about six hours. So um, I was slightly merry at 11pm <laughs> when I got the message on my phone that the, the Kickstarter had finished. So uh, that really added to it, actually. It, so, it, it was like, great, you know. You know um, yeah. It's been hard with Kickstarters. I've seen a lot of Kickstarters at the moment. You know, people don't have the spare cash and stuff. And yeah. uh, it's been really tough to to kind of get them funded and going. And, you know, I think it's, it's like testament to the podcast, having all these people support us and, uh, and, you know, back the project and make it actually happen and become a real thing. And I just can't believe that for a start that it, that the whole thing got funded, which we're so grateful for, but also that the stretch goal got hit and we were, we were so close to hitting that stretch goal, you know, um, it was it was tense at the very end, but uh, yeah, it's actually going to happen now, and uh, the, my mind's blown with the whole the whole thing. Yeah, so looking forward to twenty twenty three when we'll finally get to hold the retro hour book in our hands. And uh, thank you again from the bottom of our hearts to everyone who's uh, made our dream a reality. You know, being able to do our first book is just absolutely amazing. And uh, there have been a few, quite a lot of people actually this week getting in touch, going, oh, "I missed out on the Kickstarter. Can I still get hold of it?" We're hoping to get a few extra copies printed at the end. So. Um, Keep your ears peeled. We'll, uh, we'll update you on the podcast as and when. And of course, next week is going to be our uh, last show of the year. That will be the Retro Hour Annual Christmas Super Quiz. Oh, so um, I saw Paul Jury yesterday and uh, I was, he, he came around my house and I was like, mate, can I bribe you in some way? Because uh, he's writing the questions. <laughs> and, uh, no, it didn't happen. <laughs> But I was going to say, if, if Ravi mysteriously wins for the first time in eight years, Joe, we yeah, know why. It would be such a mystery. <laughs> Damn, I've revealed my plan now. So uh, that is coming up next week. But before we do it, though, let's have a little look back of some of our favourite bits of the year that was 2022 in retro. And uh, for my first clip, now you did mention, Ravi, that we've uh, finally got some guests on this year that we'd wanted on the podcast pretty much since the beginning. Yeah. And that uh, David Perry was definitely one of them. Now, of course, um, Shiny Entertainment, um, responsible for legendary games like Earthworm Jim. You and I interviewed David Perry from his um, his home in California, where actually he was, he was on the um, Elon Musk's internet, wasn't he? So let's keep waiting for the satellite to go over. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, it's interesting having Dave on because ever since I watched on Bad Influence, where uh, Violet Berlin went out, and, and visited him and you know he he mm. was with this amazing game studio and like earthworm jim was so innovative with the technology and stuff um i've always wanted to have him on the podcast and yeah i've always just wanted to speak to him you know and uh it, it was it was an absolutely fabulous episode and uh great for him to give us his time 
Yeah, and he definitely didn't disappoint. And um, one little clip that I pulled out that I thought was quite interesting, because obviously he worked on those um, Disney games on the Sega Mega Drive. Oh, yeah, like and Aladdin and stuff. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, you think about then, you know, early 90s, it kind of felt like when video games came out of kind of the underground, if you like, because before that, there were a bit of a kind of a nerdy kind of niche thing. But then by this stage, massive corporations like Disney were taking it seriously. And um, they had a lot of rules they had to stick to to make those games, which I think worked because, you know, Aladdin was such a polished game. And in this clip, we asked David Perry what it was like working with Disney on Aladdin. I imagine in, you know, those years leading up to that, it kind of felt like generally games were kind of regarded by companies as a bit throwaway and maybe, you know, not even as important as a toy. But then it suddenly got to this era and suddenly they realized it was a big part of the franchise, I guess. Exactly. So what happened is you would you would be in a, in a light. I'd been into Disney licensing and you're like sitting in a room with coffee cups and things like that with Disney characters on them. Like that, that's where licensing happens. And they, they thought video games were just in, like a coffee cup. There was nothing that important. Um, and in certain cases, some of the executives making the decisions had no interest in games like they were just too old. And so it took a while. I used to enjoy this because I'd go into these meetings looking at these older executives thinking, you don't care about this industry. You're not going to support this. No one's going to say yes. But what happens is over time, those people move on. And you see the the, the, the people moving in are all, uh, they have kids playing games. They love games. They grew up playing games. And it, and it changed everything. That just literally, just uh, right before my eyes in all of my Hollywood meetings, I watched the the whole industry change and start really embracing um, video games. And so people like um, Jeffrey Katzenberg, I think were way ahead of the crowd um, because, you know, they were, they were, they really understood. And so to give you a crazy example is I got, a, um, I got invited to the, the press release, I guess, for the press announcement for Aladdin. And it was at, I think it was at the, um, the CES show in, um, and, and, um, you know, which is this sort of big place. There was a lot of, um, uh, I think about a thousand press were invited to it. And, and I went and I arrived and I went to the wrong floor in the elevator and the elevator doors open or the lift, as, as you would say in England, um, and the lift doors open and imagine the whole floor of the hotel is filled with, with Aladdin characters. Um, wow. and, <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit, what is this? Cause I mean, I, I'd never, uh, we'd never had something like this for a video game. And so you go in this room, there's a thousand press there. You have Jeffrey Katzenberg on stage. You have Richard Branson on stage. You have the head of Sega has flown in from Japan and all these people, um, you know, that I respected greatly. Um, and then they did this big presentation. And then, then the doors open and income all these characters. And it sort of give you a taste of what it's like to work with Disney. Um, they think big, and and, uh, and that was a huge hit. That game for us, uh, they ended up making like the Mega Drive. They had their own box, like the Aladdin box, where you had the Aladdin edition and things like that. So it was a wonderful thing to experience, and it also meant that when I went, to, I, I was sort of I got special access to Disneyland and all kinds of benefits um, from being involved. And then Jeffrey Katzenberg called me up one day and said, would you like to do Lion King? And in my infinite wisdom, I said, no. <laughs> oh. Suddenly I'm not welcome at Disneyland. <laughs> Suddenly it's all over, right? Uh, uh, but what happened was at the time, I was thinking about um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles again. There was a, uh, a long story short on that one. Um, my, I had made the game, yes, but it turns out that the toys were made by a company in America called Playmates, and they had made like a billion dollars just on those toys. And so they wanted to get in the game industry, and they asked me would I be willing to leave Virgin and work for them and help them build their own video game wing. At the same time, Sega Technical Institute. So Sega, the games like Sonic and things like that that came out of, out of um, Sega were done there. And so I would have got to work with Yuji Naka, the, the Sonic guy, um, if I had have gone with the Sega offer. Or I could, of course, just have stayed at Virgin and worked on, on Lion King. So I had to weigh these all up. And I decided that I would take a different choice, which was I went back to Playmates and said, 
I don't really want to build your company. I want to build my own, but would you be willing to fund it? And, uh, and they said, sure. And the understanding was that we'd probably end up making some kind of licensed um, games that relate to their toys. But what happened was we pitched them um, Earthworm Jim and they really liked it. So we ended up building Earthworm Jim. And, and that was really interesting because that, that led us on a path of instead of licensing in someone else's brand with Earthworm Jim, we actually owned the brand and we got um, it one game of the year as well. And it ended up becoming a toy line and a television show and Halloween masks and lunch baskets and all kinds of different, uh, all these different things. So what an episode, David Perry, again, someone that we've wanted on the podcast for like, what, seven, eight years, and we finally managed to get him on in 2022. And of course, I'll let link up the full episode in our show notes as well. So what's your first highlight of the year then, Joe? Um, so for me, I've kind of gone in reverse order by accident, like in terms of like, you know, the dates of them and stuff. Um, but we had Kevin Backus on, on episode 347, so that'd be about 10 weeks ago now. Um, mm. And he was responsible, you know, for kind of like bringing the Xbox to the market. And, you know, it was really, really interesting to kind of hear about his relationship with Bill Gates um, and also like how, you know, the, the kind of the story behind how, you know, there's that Microsoft technology and the Dreamcast and then that kind of transitioned into the Xbox. Um, and I really loved his story um, about how, you know, he helped make Half-Life and how he actually wanted Half-Life to be a packing game with Windows XP. And I just think, you know, I, I love to think there's a parallel universe out there where that happened and like the gaming world might look a little bit different, maybe not too different, but I just think that would have been absolutely mind blowing if that had happened. Um, and I just think it was a really great score from Ravi, you know, to get such a big guest for us. Well, you know, like Microsoft, the Xbox to us. Well, Microsoft didn't have that reputation for gaming, did they? No, there was, no. uh, you know, he even says in the interview, people were laughing, going, "What the spreadsheet company is going to be making a console?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, so you know, um, there's, there's a there's a part where he says they sit down with kind of like a, a test audience, and it's just like, if Microsoft made a games console, what would you want on it? And they were just like, they couldn't get their head around it. Like they were like, well, it need a PC monitor. And will Clippy need, be on it? it? Will Clippy be on it? <laughs> it, needs, it? It needs Excel, you know, like, and it was like, no, they're going to make a games console. So yeah, the whole episode was just really, really kind of like mind blowing and interesting for me. I can't remember if I got a beta of Wolfenstein. I definitely got beta copies of Doom before it was released uh, mm. and Quake. And so, you know, that, that, that preceded and predated my time at Microsoft, but the Valve guys, uh, you know, I got to know as like a fellow, like early licensee of that engine, which is one of the first engines that was ever licensed. And so I got to know Gabe really well. And obviously because of Gabe's time at Microsoft, he was very eager to try to build some sort of relationship. What very few people know is that actually I was talking with Gabe about the potential of putting, uh, bundling a version of Half-Life with, I think it was Windows 98. Um, mm. You know, I, I felt really, really good about that. I thought it was a really good showcase, but Again, you know, the the team at Microsoft felt that it was sort of the wrong, you know, kind of the wrong foot forward. That that it was it would send the wrong message because of the violent content of Half Life. Even if the version that was bundled with Windows was relatively violence free, uh, that that association would be problematic. And so it didn't end up it didn't end up going anywhere. But I really felt like that would be a strong statement. You know, more so than than Solitaire or you know Minesweeper. You no. Know, no disrespect to those, you know, those pieces of software. They're obviously very, very popular. But I really wanted to move, um, you know, sort of much more casual gamers into understanding what was available, you know, out there in the world of gaming uh, beyond, uh, you know, beyond simple puzzle games. Well, talking of a uh, video game violence as well, Game Blocker was a interesting kind of piece of technology, and uh, were Microsoft kind of pushing stuff like that? And also, what was their attitude towards? Uh, video game violence at the time not not really um i think that their you know their approach as a as the steward of the platform was relatively you know hands off um you know it uh again my uh windows mac open platforms you don't have to have microsoft's permission to make a windows game you don't have apple you need to have apple's permission to have uh, to develop a macintosh game and so um so i think you know uh, I don't think Microsoft really had much of a, of a perspective at all about 
violence when it came to the platform. You know, obviously they wouldn't really promote violent games, um, but they wouldn't really prevent them either. It was sort of a, an arm's length relationship. Yeah, imagine what a different world it would be if we had Half Life installed on um, every Office PC instead of Solitaire. Yeah, <laughs> not, much, not much work would have got done back Clippy in the day. Popping up saying, "Do you want to play Half Life?" <laughs> <laughs> and what a groundbreaking game as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely worth checking out that episode if you haven't heard that one already. Now, uh, for your first highlight, Ravi, this was such a fun episode, this one, wasn't it? This was one of my favourite episodes because having a voice actor uh, for video games on a podcast just works so well. And um, this was uh, Lani Minella. So um, she works for Audio Gods, which was one of the first kind of audio companies uh, that did like voiceovers uh, commercially. And she found... the voice of John St. John, who was Duke Nukem. And um, she's great because she can put that emotion and that that style into into a voice and uh, a lot of feeling where, uh, you know, other, other people might not be able to, but she really knew what suited a video game. And uh, one of my favourite titles was Unreal Tournament. And uh, in this clip, she, she, she has a lot of the death-killing sounds. And uh, uh, then she also talks about the, this radio puka, which is this kind of a way of announcing where it's very, you know, pronunciated and how you have to really tone that down um, where you wouldn't have had Duke Nukem going, this is Duke Nukem. You know, you had to have it uh, toned down and a bit, bit more subtle and like the differences that are needed for actually doing a voice on a video game. You know, when you're hitting, it's usually... <laughs> Now, when you're getting hurt, is oh, ah, there you go. <laughs> that Got takes me it, takes me back to those days. Yeah, I, one thing I loved about um, Unreal Tournament as well was was the kind of uh, the different kills. You know, headshots and then like multi oh, yeah. kill, and uh, that really got, added fun you. to the game. You know, I I got to tell you, there was this guy that was doing the announcer voice, and it was going to be pitched down and everything from his normal voice, and they wanted it very flat. Everything would be like, now, now, uh, red team wins the match. So you couldn't show any favoritism. It was like, red, yellow team wins the match, da 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 And this guy used to be a radio puker. You know, he was kind of like John St. John had his yeah. radio days. Like, this is John St. John. Well, this guy also wanted to put red team wins them because he used to be the announcer for the Cincinnati Bengals or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I had to keep him and John flat, you know, say, as you're talking, make your hand go across in a horizontal line so you can't go, you know, that kind of thing. So that's where we would do the death match, you know, and that all that kind of stuff had to be very neutral because this guy and John both, John would turn Duke instead of being kind of like a Clint Eastwood, like, come get some, he, come get some. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. so of that's where American you can, sports announcer style. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very hard. Once once a radio puker, always a radio puker. It's hard to get them not to because in the old days, you know, not everybody had a deep voice. Mm. So they learned to go to the Columbia School of Broadcasting to talk like that. You know, and that's what we call the radio puker. Yeah, I did love that episode. I love the fact that you got us to do the uh, the Bubsy voice as well. Oh, your favorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you check that out. Of course, I'll, uh, I'll link all the episodes in the show notes. So you can have a little binge listen over Christmas. So for my next one, um, you mentioned, you know, legends that we've had on the show in 2022. And Ed Rotberg mm. came on the show. Now, he was like a core member of Atari's coin-op team. Uh, joined the company in 1979. He worked on games like Stun Runner, Blasteroids, and Battle Zone, probably the, the best-known game that he worked on. Um, definitely an old school arcade favourite. But actually Battlezone back then was not only used by, you know, kids in the arcades, but also it turned out that the the US military were using Battlezone to train people to basically drive tanks. And in this clip here, we hear about um an incident when the US military approached Atari to ask them to do a special version of Battlezone just for them as a training simulator. And kind of the um the turmoil that kind of went through his head when he was working on that project. Not my favorite chapter in the history of Battlezone, but um, one of the guys I was working with, uh, well, who worked at the company, uh, was a manager there named Rick Moncrief. He had been contacted by 
or at least Atari had been contacted by a group of uh, retired generals, and they ended up sh shoveling this off to Rick, and uh, they were interested in pursuing a training device using the Battlezone hardware, something that would train uh, their soldiers to, uh, they could have a game where they could uh, get useful tactile feedback and, and operational feedback uh, for one of the uh, fighting vehicles, uh, the Bradley fighting vehicle that uh, was being produced. And after Battlezone was finished, uh, Rick came to me and said, uh, you know, this was a few months after Battlezone had finished, and said, you know, uh, you know, we've promised these guys we're going to get something to get a demo together for them uh, for the next, uh, it's a thing called TRADOC, and that's uh, where, you know, it's training for, you know, various military groups would get together and discuss different ways, and they wanted to propose training them with the game, and uh, they wanted a demo unit that would uh, demonstrate that soldiers could in improve their efficiency and competence uh, by playing uh, a game. And so I had uh, th this, the next TRADOC meeting was like three and a half months away. So I had like three months to develop this. It was not trivial. We had to develop an entire new controller. There were a lot of things involved. Uh, they basically wanted to train the gunner position, uh, but the vehicle had to move as well. So there were things with that. There were like four uh, different types of ordnance on these vehicles, uh, a machine gun, incendiary shells, armor-piercing shells, and tow missiles. And so we had to uh, simulate all of those, uh, which in battle zone, it was, there was no gravity. Um, there, was, there was no trajectory to the shells. They just went in a straight line. Well, all of these weapons, with the exception of the tow missile, had to deal with gravity. Um, and mm -hmm. there had to be ranging uh, information and so it was a fairly hefty project to get done in three months. I basically lost that three months of my life. I would go into work in the morning. I'd work about 16, 18 hours. I'd come home, go to bed, get up, kiss my wife goodbye, and, you know, rinse and repeat for three months straight, including weekends. So um, that was a big burnout for me. You know? It also sounds like, you know, because before that, you mean, you're making games that are designed to be entertainment and fun. Now, all of a sudden, you're doing like a, a simulator for soldiers. That's quite a change in, in ethos as well, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah, it is. And in, in fact, I um, at the, the, the brainstorming session that came up during the time of, of this, uh, I did go off site for that. Uh, I had made it clear before, by before I started on this project, that I would only work on it if they assured me that I would not have to work on any follow-up military products ever for Atari uh, because I wanted to do fun. Uh, I didn't want to train killing. I had a, uh, you know, philosophical problem with that as well. So um, they agreed to that. And uh, at, at the brainstorming session, I made a very impassioned plea that this was not a business that Atari should get into. Um, one of my prior jobs had, had been uh, with Texas Instrument, who was doing uh, projects for the government as well. And, you know, I was aware of how, when you do government contracts, uh, the government gets to look into a lot of things in your company uh, and, uh, you know, they can make something maybe a bit stronger than request, shall we say, uh, in how you do business. So I just didn't want to get involved in all that. I, I expressed my opinion to the company about it. <laughs> Ed Rotberg, what an absolute legend. And they're definitely one of my favorite interviews of the year. Worth checking that one out. So who have you got next then, Joe? Um, so for me, this next one um, was Michael Case, which, you know, I thought like, oh, okay, I've not, I've not heard of this guy before when Ravi said that we got him on. But his company was responsible for doing a lot of PC ports you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and I actually ended up finding the episode really, really interesting and fascinating. And, you know, him talking about like his relationship with Hideo Kojima, because he did Metal Gear Solid and how they ported Metal Gear Solid to the PC and how essentially accidentally made it look a bit better than it did <laughs> on the uh, PlayStation. And, you know, they had to turn the graphics down and, you know, because Hideo Kojima was really upset with it because of in the, in the original Metal Gear Solid, their faces are kind of like quite blurry and line work. And in the PC version, it they actually kind of like rejigged their faces a little bit. And Hideo Kojima was really upset with that. But the actual clip I wanted to use as a highlight was kind of learning about the testing that goes into porting a PC game. And it was something Ravi raised, which I found really interesting. And it's how essentially 
you know, even to this day, the amount of different PCs or built, you know, gaming PCs people have out there, the different variations of them must be in the thousands because of all the different graphic cards and stuff like that we can use. Yeah. And it actually turned out his company had 400 PCs set up where they just sit and try and break these ports of games and they would just sit there testing them just to make sure that when it went out to the consumer, it actually worked for them on their setup. And I'd never kind of put that kind of thought into it before because I'm not a PC gamer. So I actually found that really interesting to hear that story. What we had to do at one point was send one of our programmers over there to um, work on it with them, you know, in their test lab on the actual computers. You know, he was the guy who wrote a lot of the code. Malkia, he was this Bulgarian guy. And he ended up getting hired away from me by Microsoft. Because oh, wow. he was the big <laughs> Yes, his NDA, but you know, who am I against Microsoft? Uh, I didn't say that. Allegedly. So, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> so speaking of all these different developers and Microsoft and stuff, what was it like working with all these big different companies, you know, PlayStation? Was there really strict requirements for the ports and what you guys were working on? Strict requirements. Um, nah, I wouldn't say so. I mean, it was, you know, well, if you run those games today, they won't run on a computer. Unfortunately, they changed DirectX. We always use DirectX, the Microsoft product, and uh, we used it in the proper way, and uh, they won't run anymore. You know, So uh, you, you have to get a vintage computer if you want to run any, any of our games. So um, Abe's Odyssey Oddworld was one of the biggest selling games for the PS1 at the time. Was there a lot of requirements to match the PS1 version when porting that? The people at Oddworld were very easy to work with, and they gave us great access to all their content. So it was very easy to um, do the conversion, and we were able to talk to their programmers, etc. You know, so you know, basically, it was all written in C programming language. So you know, we just had to convert to C so that it would run on the PC. Not too much of a problem. I mean, the graphics pipeline. There was you know some issues with that, you know, just um, converting into the, the format that we needed to use on the PC. But it was it was pretty easy, you know. It, it was a pretty smooth experience. Um, and, you know, the game was very well written. The programmers did a good job on it. So uh, it, it ran very well on the PC. Now for the next clip, um, I love this interview as well, Ravi. And uh, it was great to hear about a game that, really brought me back to my childhood. Because, I mean, I always love racing games, but there's something about playing a racing game where you can actually batter <laughs> your opponents with chains and baseball bats. And, of course, we're talking about Road Rash. Yeah. Oh, God. Having Randy Breen on um, talking about Road Rash. You know, Road Rash was one of these series that I just I want to see back nowadays. I, I just I don't know why it's missing. And uh, I, think, I think it was fantastic, just the mix of, like, racing at speed but also the brutality you can choose to race or you can choose to fight or you can do both and um in this clip randy's talking about the actual fighting but also the influence um of stuff like akira and uh the wider kind of biking culture that actually went in to influence road rash car games with guns on them and and so on and i just thought that that was a little too it, it just didn't seem to make sense. I mean, for one thing, you're, you're trying to drive in one direction and, and aim in another direction. And it just, you know, it didn't, it didn't hold together in my mind, both from a fantasy standpoint or from, you know, a, an interactivity standpoint. And so the thing that struck me with motorcycles was that, you know, first of all, I was toying with uh, racing and, you know, the, the competition, even in those, I mean, this goes back, you know, far, far bef before the computer game industry. But, you know, motorcycle competition can get kind of physical. And it's interesting because you can see the rider on the machine as opposed to, you know, a car where you might see the, the helmet sticking out, you know, in an open cockpit. Um, and the fact that the rider is, is fully visible, I thought was, was kind of exciting, you know, that there was an opportunity to create drama from you know that that physicality and you know the uh, the other thing um you know well what i was getting at with the racing is that in racing it's not unusual for these riders 
to kind of elbow and kick each other. And, you know, it's not very common, but it happens. And, you know, I think that I put that together. There was, you know, I was a fan of Akira. And in fact, uh, you know, in my presentation for the concept, I presented both these shots of, you know, what's the equivalent of MotoGP, you know, where riders were actually shoving off each other, you know, entering a turn and also some of the gang material from uh, Akira, along with some other things, uh, the bike pump scene from uh, Breaking Away. You know, it really makes me want to get my Mega Drive set up again this weekend and uh, have a bit of a, a blast get, on Road Get Road Rush Road in. Game. Get Rush in. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, that needs to come back. Somebody needs to make a new version of Road Oh, Road man, Road. imagine Long how good that would be. Now, for my next clip, um, another legend that we had on the show this year. And uh, I think this game probably sold more Amigas back in the day than anything else. And this is Martin Edmondson. Now, in this clip here, we're talking about, of course, Shadow of the Beast. And uh, I mean, again, Martin kind of admitted in this interview that gameplay wise, probably wasn't the most in depth game you could get on the Amiga. But we all remember those incredible graphics. And in this clip in particular, we're talking about that parallax scrolling. And I still remember seeing that at my friend's house back in the day, just being desperate for an Amiga after that. So here's Martin explaining all about that legendary scrolling in Shadow of the Beast. That that what that started from, I got hold of the um, Amiga hardware reference uh, manual, the Addison Wesley book, when I was nowhere near really writing anything on the Amiga. It was, it was still one of those things that as soon as I'd seen the Amiga and seen what it was capable of by watching Marble Madness, I wanted to be able to work on it. So I got hold of that hardware reference manual, read it back to back, and then designed what I thought was going to be possible with the parallax scrolling. So I talked before about the copper code process that allowed you to split the screen and then with it having hardware scrolling, which I was never used to from the BBC Micro, which, you know, did have hardware scrolling, but it only eight pixels at a time. So it was as good as useless for a lot of purposes. And it, uh, and it just seemed to be uh, perfect for what we wanted to do. And I'd noticed, you know, parallaxing is something that anybody can see by just looking out the side of a train. You can see how stuff closer to you is whizzing faster than stuff further away. So I, I just designed it on a piece of paper, really, was where the splits would be, where the, what the speeds would be for each of the uh, the splits. And we ended up with 13 layers and how, how we'd use different play field modes on the Amiga because it was so powerful. It was so flexible, that machine. It had different ways of setting up what could overlay what, how many colors would be in it. And, and people used to talk in terms of the sprites being the most powerful thing, but they weren't at all. The most powerful thing was the code processor and the split screen hardware scrolling and and, uh, and the way that you could have entire screens overlaying it, other entire screens in separate play fields. It was a very, very flexible, powerful gaming machine. So, you know, designed on, designed on paper, we finished whatever game it was that we were working on and, and just got stuck into that as a demo. So that what happened was that, Ballistics had just been recently published, and I took a demo of Shadow of the Beast, which was only the introduction screen. I don't think you could even run around. It was just the ground split up, scrolling, and a tree, and a cloud, and the blimp, and all that stuff. I think I put the Cygnosis logo in just to sort of um, sweeten the pie a bit, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Ian saw it, and just it was amazing, because he just sort of gathered everybody in the company around it. It was like, oh, you've got to come and have a look at this. You've got to have, have a look at this. And all the technical guys and you know, and the, the marketing guys, everyone's just sort of crowded around it and just, right, we, what, we've got to do something special with this, which was really nice to see because I've deliberately designed it in a sort of Cygnosis way in terms of the graphics and the fantasy art that Barbarian had, you know, and it was that sort of thing. So I suppose from that point of view, it was also an easy sell because it had their, it had the look of a Cygnosis game as well, but plus the, you know, the technical abilities that were afforded by the, by the hardware for the nice arcadey scrolling. And I remember, you know, like I mentioned before, when I, when I first saw that game, I was just blown away by the graphics on it. Because I come from a Commodore 8-bit machine. I had a Commodore 16 before it. So oh, right, you okay, can imagine yeah. kind of what a leave that was seeing Shadow of the Beast. And, you know, all my friends were the same. If you wanted to show off what an Amiga would do, you'd put Shadow of the Beast on to show other people. I mean, did you get much of a reaction from Commodore then? Because that must have helped sell a lot of Amigas. Um, yes, it did. I believe I was told it did. And, uh, and I suppose it's believable from the point of view of most Amiga games at the time were ports of Atari ST games. And that was because the Atari ST at the time was a much bigger 
uh, machine bigger installed base and the Amiga was you know newer and much more expensive therefore you just didn't expect to sell that many on the Amiga and the the approach that we'd taken was if we do a game which is a hundred percent tailored towards this machine and is not going to be physically possible to write on any other machine to play on any other machine then that will appeal to those people so much that it would sell machines or if not sell machines anybody with that machine would buy it because that's a real show it to my mates right this is why this is why my amiga is better than your st that sort of a, a, an approach that sort of a game and i thought it was quite brave of Cygnosis as well because they didn't really know they were basically ignoring the st which was the bigger base to publish this game and spend all this money and the t-shirt and the box and all that stuff that uh, came with it on a very small at the time installed base and hope that it was impressive enough to actually get a big um uh, you know, a, a, a big proportion of the owners of the machine buying it. So another interview that's definitely worth a listen back over Christmas, Martin Edmondson. And uh, of course, I'll uh, link up all the episodes of full ones in the show notes as well. Now, uh, more of our best of the year coming up. Uh, and we need to tell you about this incredible book from uh, Bitmap Books as well that you might want to get in your Christmas stocking if you're quick. Uh, before that, though, um, tell us about your next clip then, Joe. This was an amazing interview. Oh, man, this... I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say like you know what number one was and what number three was and all that kind of stuff. But this one, man, John Melcher, episode three hundred and thirty. Um, he had a really, really interesting career working for Fox Interactive and Vivendi, um, and just kind of talking about his work on all those kind of like PS Two Simpsons games, talking about Road Rage and uh, the rivalry they had with uh, Simpsons skateboarding, and then. Talking about GTA the, as well. Well, yeah, yeah. And talking about the legendary game, Simpsons Hit and Run, which has just had so many like articles about it in the last couple of years about it being remade and stuff. And, you know, kind of getting like his two cents on that was really interesting. And then the incredible story at the end um, about the Ghostbusters game, you know, that came out in 2009 and how he had to work with Bill Murray and Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd. That whole story was just like amazing. I think this might have been one of our longest episodes we've ever did because he had just such an interesting story. But uh, the clip I wanted to use, um, for me, was one of the funniest clips of the year. And it's talking about how when they when they kind of like said, right, what do we want Simpsons Hit and Run to look like? And, you know, from Road Rage, and it was like, well, we want to get out the car. We want to run around and we want to do stuff in Springfield. And, you know, we want to be able to punch and kick people and stuff like that. And Fox Interactive, Fox, you know, 20th Century Fox are like, well, hold up, like, we don't want this to be a violent game. So then they've got the kind of the first testing done and they hand it to Matt Groening to play. And the first thing he does is jump out the car as Homer and start beating up Marge. And Matt <laughs> Groening absolutely loved it and literally ended up like kicking Marge all the way down the street for like miles. <laughs> and they were like, well, there we have it. There's our game kind of thing. Um, so hearing that story um, and essentially kind of relating it to Christmas, I think 2004, 2003, when I got that game and pretty much doing the exact same thing. The first thing I did on that game as well was, was you know, run around kicking people. It was just absolutely hilarious to hear. That's kind of like what the creators of The Simpsons did as well when they got that. And, and there was it. a good history of Simpsons games, but this was oh, really yeah. the kind of next generation of them. And they and they really cracked it with those titles. You know, they're, they're absolute classic. You know, the, the crazy taxi comparisons when it hit the marketplace were absolutely valid. But I think... Um, it's one thing where Gracie and Matt were like, well, we're not going to do that again. We're not going to just be a Me Too thing. The big debate between the two was uh, Radical came to us and said, we want to get out of the car and walk around. Yeah. yeah. And that was a big debate with Fox executives on the interactive side of like, what does that mean? You know, there are rules to that. You know, we, we did a demo <laughs> of getting out of the car in front of Homer's house from Road Rage before we redid the engine and like, we had kicking in there because they wanted a jump. The jump also had like a kick to it. And I remember like the first thing Matt did is he just kicked Marge as Homer. <laughs> and he kicked her all the way down the street. And he looked at us like, we're never doing that in the game. This, this is not about abuse. I'm, it, it fairly certain that's the I'm fairly certain that's the first thing I did when I played hit and run <laughs> was just kick the first person I could find. Exactly, right? We do a good job of trying. You cannot really hit the kids. The kids don't react. Yeah, to adults, yeah. There's no child abuse. But yeah, everybody, uh, it's funny, poor Marge. Everybody tries to kick Marge. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, the, getting out of the car was the big part of that. And then once the, everybody saw the potential of this, and, and and then we started to build Springfield with more gameplay per square feet in mind, like the motel mm -hmm. way off the distance with, with Lisa. 
and, and make the map. It's still kind of like, it's not an open world. It's kind of a track hidden by buildings and objects and hills. But Hit Run 2 would have been what, every, what everybody wanted. But I felt like, you know, Matt told us, this is the game. We got it right. He still, to this day, refers to that as probably the best Simpsons game. And Gracie was very happy with it. So I think, like, at the end of the day, it sold very well. So, like, you know, the funny thing about that game is, like, you know, Fox Interactive was getting out of games. So they sold us to the Vindy, the entire group. So during the middle of that game, I think we were at Alpha. I left Fox on a Friday and showed up at Vindy on a Monday and just continued to produce the game. It was very odd. Now, for your next one, Ravi, um, not only do we think this guy is an absolute legend, but actually he was named one of the top 25 gaming gods by PC Gamer Magazine, and this was Bruce Shelley. Yeah, oh my God. Having Bruce co-creator of Railroad Tycoon and Civilization on was just mind-blowing. Civ is one of those games that I've sunk quite a lot of my life into. I can't actually play it anymore because if I do, you know, work just gets set aside, eating gets set aside, and I basically <laughs> live in the game for a week. So I have to stop myself. It's like an addiction civilization. Uh, absolutely mind-blowing game. And uh, the series is still going on, and it's still absolutely huge. And um, in this clip, Bruce is actually talking about the first version of civilization that he played and how it actually wasn't a turn-based game. Originally, it was real-time, and it was a, a lot more based in the kind of ancient time period and just to have bruce on like this whole interview I, I was nervous you know and i'm not usually nervous with the interviews i was i was so nervous um i kept calling age of empires age of the empires i was like you know <laughs> all over the place uh, because you've noticed ravi you, youtube noticed yeah because he's he's just such an absolute legend so uh yeah th this this interview for me is like the number one Yes, I remember exactly. I mean, I was May of 1990, and uh, the way Sid and I would work, uh, I worked for him, is that he would give me a version of a game, and I'd play it for a while, and then we'd go down, i go down to his office, we'd sit there sometimes for hours, and we he'd play it on screen, we'd talk about it, we'd make, you know, what we liked, what we didn't like, what, what would be cool to add here, and that kind of stuff. It was a very iterative process, and uh, one day, you know, we talked about, we had played a board game called Civilization, we played another game called empire deluxe and at one point he says what would you change about empire deluxe give me a list of 10 things you would change about empire deluxe if we were going to rebuild that game and i i sat down and i thought about it for a while i actually gave her if i remember i gave him like 12 things that would change trying to be a you know be a star and uh so we talked about it quite a bit and he would prototype he always had a handful of prototypes on his machine that he was fooling around with and then one day in May of 1990, he gave me a floppy disk and he says, try this. This is a, this might be our civilization game. And, uh, I saved that discs, you know, I, for years I had that in my, in my stuff. And I finally, yeah, I thought I was going to donate it to a museum and he, and Sid asked me to have it back. So I gave it back to him and he got it going again. It was not, it was not a turn-based game. It was real time. It was more set in ancient times or pre, you know, like prehistoric times. And, you know, it was more time in that period as I recall. And. I mean, I knew right away, I said, well, this is really cool. You know, we're going to, this is going to be great. You know, I just, I was just very impressed. And from that day on, we started working on civilization a little bit, but what happened was the manager of the company wanted that spy game that we had never finished. And they told me I could not work on civilization or railroad tycoon two or whatever until we finished that spy game. And so Sid reluctantly said, okay, let's finish the spy game. We got that done. And then we were, we were given permission to go to a full blast on civilization. Every day I would get a version and I'd play it. And then we'd sit down and talk about it for a couple hours. And then he'd get a new version going and we'd play it some more. And that was, that went on day after day, after day, after day. He wouldn't let anybody else play it except me for a lot for months. And guys were coming in my office or friends, you know, girls and guys were coming in and say, what is going on with this game? And they were all interested. They watched me play or they watched, they talked to Sid about it. But he wouldn't let anybody else play. He just wanted to keep it tight you know he didn't want to have a lot of feedback that he didn't want to deal with so he relied on me to be there everybody and my tastes were like you know good enough for him and and then finally he said okay we're making this game this is going to be the thing and by then i knew we really had a special game on our hands so i was thinking i'm sitting in a studio or a little office in north baltimore maryland and i'm i'm working on a game that's going to blow people away i think it's really going to be great yeah what you think ravi up off the ground from going we're not worthy. After that, <laughs> totally. uh, 
Bruce Shelley, what an absolute legend. And of course, a little reminder, if you want to hear these full interviews, uh, check the uh, show notes on your podcast app or our website, theretrohour.com. There'll be links to them all on there. Now, more of our favourite bits of 2022 on the way. Before we do that, um, definitely one of the highlights of 2022 has been working with our amazing sponsor, the guys at Bitmap Books, who uh, we're proud to say are going to be joining us again for 2023. And uh, you might want to treat yourself to one of their books because, I mean, I'm looking around. I know you guys are all the same. Look over at your bookshelf, look over at your gaming area. We've all got bitmap books in our collections and they just look incredible next to your games, don't they? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've i got like a stack of about six of them now and I just love picking them up and just having a flick through them and just reading them, you know, looking at the beautiful artwork they've got in them as well. It always really takes me back to those days as well. Now, if we're talking about genres that really need an in-depth book to explore them, first-person shooters. Now, this is Bitmap Book's latest epic book. It's called I'm Too Young to Die, The Ultimate Guide to First-Person Shooters, 1992 to 2002. And it's mad to think, just in that 10 years, kind of how much first-person shooter games change. I I love that they all used to be called Doom clones. Yeah. (laughs) Everything was just a Doom clone until it became its whole own genre. And this book just explores it all with like beautiful timelines and also the way that the book's presented it's like in an a2 format but it's um horizontal and it, mm. it just looks really really stunning now this celebrates more than 180 games actually kind of traces back the history with the precursors to the fps games back in 1969 with you know, early light gun shooters as well and then of course you know really kicks off in 92 when wolfenstein 3d dropped and then takes you all the way through the 90s you know legendary games you mentioned doom quake half-life goldeneye 007 halo as well so these massive behemoths the games that defined the first person shooter genre and um you know they also talk about how it helped to trigger the 3d graphics arms race as well because i mean nothing sold hardware back in the day, like the FPS explosion. Yeah. So uh, if you want to treat yourself, and um, this is definitely one of their books that you cannot miss, a 424-page hardback printed to their usual high standards, and you can check that out and uh, treat yourself, you know, it's Christmas, to one of their books, and uh, of course support the show by doing it. Have a look at their website at bitmapbooks.com. Right then, back into our favourite bits of 2022 on the Retro Hour podcast. And uh, going right back to the start of the year, this was definitely one of my favourite interviews of the year. Did this back in January this year, and we were joined by a true veteran of the video games industry. That was Rod Cousins. Now, he gave us some incredible stories about his time as uh, Vice President of Activision, the rise and fall of Acclaim Entertainment as well, and really exploring the early days of the British microcomputer gaming scene. And obviously, you think back then, piracy was a massive problem, particularly when, you know, we discovered that our mum's tape-to-tape player (laughs) would actually copy video games as well (laughs) and kind of change everything for a lot of us. And uh, I thought I'd ask Rod, because obviously he was right in the middle of it all, kind of how Activision approached the problem of piracy. I think, you know, obviously one big difference about having, you know, the home computer scene was much more successful in Europe than it was in like Japan, for example, where, you know, it was a bit more console focused and America was like the NES. How, how much of a piracy problem did Activision have in Europe at that stage? Yeah, I mean, piracy was a problem not confined to Europe. But, you know, if I step back a little bit, the thing that was really obvious about the British scene was the development talent. The development talent and creativity in Europe was top draw, could compete against any of them. And I remember I was out in the States when I was at Activision and I was walking into places and I was seeing all these incredible setups with workstations and great, great, you know, hosting computers and so forth. And they weren't necessarily any better or as good as what was done in the uk and i asked an american pretty good guy uh, from a technical point of view why he thought that was and he said because you guys your source was normally something like a bbc microcomputer or a sinclair spectrum which against what was available to developers over theirs meant we had to work harder and get more out of the processors than the counterparts over there who were lazier and not as creative and i and i actually think that was probably true at the time and so we mm-hmm. you know 
when you start to think of what went on through the BBC, which was the adopted, you know, thing in in our schools and so forth, we got huge amounts out of it, and and uh, and uh, I think I think that you know stood the test of time. Plus, there was a cultural thing. I mean, if you looked at movies, we always followed, um, but we were always like number two or three uh, ahead of anyone else. And um, I think we start. It created this hotbed of talent, and some of which migrated to the states and so forth. What was the part? Second part of the question. It was more about whether piracy was, oh, a, yeah, was a big sorry. issue for, for uh, yeah, on, on the computers. Well, because it, it was, and it was mainly because of tape, right? And uh, which was very easy to pirate. And uh, I remember I did a Newsnight program where we tracked and followed them around in the, in the UK. I also remember I went out to Singapore uh, when we were under the ownership of, um, of Argus Press Software, and uh, a member of the board was a guy called Tim Goldblythe, who is also, and Michael Spicer, who's in the government. And we went out to Singapore as part of a British trade delegation. And uh, I was out there, and we were all being uh, politically correct and saying all the right things. And this Chinese guy came up to me and said, do you realize your software is being pirated in Singapore? And I said, no, why? He said, come with me. You know, why I did this, I don't know. I just jumped in his car and went off with him and he took me around the back streets, took me into this place and there were all our games. And actually, they wow. were pretty pretty good. And so I said to the guy, the owner of the shop, I said, uh, these are my games. He said, no, no, they're mine. I said, no, no, they're mine. That's my copyright. And he said, no, I made them here in the shop. They're mine. And that was their logic. And so I started to do something about it. And uh, I had an interview with the newspaper out there called The Straits Times, and which was everywhere because this guy was the official distributor of Sinclair. And, uh, right. and so I called Sinclair about it. And anyhow, the next thing, I got a call from um, British Electric Traction, um, who had bought, who was the ultimate holding company, and told, telling me to back off and not do this because it wasn't good for relationships. And uh, so I had to drop it. But uh, piracy was a big problem everywhere. And I mean, there were some of us reckoned, you know, depending on the game, anywhere three to 10 times copies were out in the open market. And that started to have an impact on the industry overall. So it was a big problem. And I mean, you know, if you bring it fast forward to today, I remember going out to China in the very early days and talking to companies like Shanda who were struggling with this. And they said, well, you may as well give the game away free. And really, that was the prelude to free to play because they couldn't beat the pirates, no matter how sophisticated encryption they had and so forth. So they, again, changed the game design, gave it away, and then went back to a coin-op model where you design it for people to keep, you know, paying micro transactions to get through the game so i love that interview one of our early ones from 2022 definitely worth this is why i love doing the podcast because we we cover stuff like piracy and stuff that you know yeah. people won't usually talk about and it's really interesting to get both perspectives on that yeah, absolutely. Now, um, another absolute superstar that we had on the show this year, and actually someone that we uh, were hanging out with in Norway, weren't we? Because he was over there at Retro Mesa. <laughs> yeah, he, he loved Norway. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this is uh, John St. John, a.k.a. Duke Nukem for my fourth choice. Oh, man, this episode, I was in stitches the whole way through it. It was just like, you know, even right down to just the start when we, like, when we jumped on the call, he came on as Duke Nukem. <laughs> and like I was like a little bit like starstruck like and he was just I'm not going to do the voice but he was just like hello Joe kind of I said I wasn't going to do the voice I just had to do it <laughs> but he was just like talking to us and he was like the retro hour is amazing and all this kind of stuff and it was just like I, I like to think it was a bit of a breath e fresh air for him as well because we didn't just sit there saying do the voice do the voice we actually asked him about his career and everything like that you know and I feel like he really got into it and he, he really gave us a lot of juicy stuff um, but the clip I chose for me, I'm a really big 80s film buff. And, uh, you know, Ravi asked a really like interesting question about kind of like when you got the script for Duke Nukem and stuff like that, did you think it was a bit raunchy? Did you think it was a bit much? Like, you know, were you a bit worried about kind of like being involved in this game? And he was like, no, man, like I'll do anything you, you pay me to do kind of thing. I'll, you know, you pay me, I'll say it. And he, 
it was kind of telling a story about how like you know the whole point of Duke Nukem was it, it ripped off a lot of like 80s and 90s action films and stuff like Evil Dead Evil and, Dead yeah. and you know They Live with Roddy Piper and stuff like that and he was saying how like you know Bruce Campbell who I love Bruce Campbell from Evil Dead and stuff like to this day still doesn't like John St. John because he's like you ripped me off man and he's like well I didn't rip you off the scripts <laughs> ripped <laughs> you off um, but I just loved kind of like finding out about that and like how the scripts kind of came about and stuff um, it's just a really, really, really fun uh, episode. And then, like you say, we met him a couple of weeks later uh, in Norway and ended up having some drinks with him. It was just really surreal and really awesome. Uh, <laughs> they told me that there was going to be some um, some stuff that might be objectionable as a voice mm-hmm. actor. And I looked at the script and I said, oh, no, I, I'll say anything you want to pay me for. Not a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was all comedic. And most of the lines that uh, Duke sort of made famous were stolen from other projects, you know, from mm-hmm. Rowdy Roddy Piper and from Bruce Campbell. And I, um, I was literally about to say they live with uh, Roddy Piper. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I think they uh, they both uh, were amused uh, at the fact that uh, the Duke Nukem character made those lines even more famous. Mm. Um, you know, they delivered them originally in their projects, but uh, Bruce Campbell to this day, I think, hates me for that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think he of. likes it. I don't think he likes hearing me say, hail to the king, baby. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I was going to say, how, how much was it based on like the evil dad and that kind of really like camp horror kind of uh, yeah, <laughs> genre, it, you know, over the top stuff. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't just their projects either. A lot of the stuff in Duke Nukem games was stolen from Hollywood. That was the whole point. You know, mm. they weren't trying to rub anybody the wrong way. It was just silly, funny to steal lines from other projects and and make them Duke's own. You know, yeah, and 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 it kind of had the fun of those movies. You know, a lot yeah. of people would watch those movies just for the like outrageous scenes and exactly the, uh, really yeah. bad enemies and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. John St. John, what an absolute superstar. And I think, uh, I, I love the fact that we're hanging out with him in Norway. He came in, I think he basically drank the bar dry of tequila. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. And was yeah. like, like sober. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, definitely one of the best, uh, biggest guests that we've had on in 2022. Now for your next one, Ravi, um, you were so in your element here. Steve Weatherill. Now he worked on all sorts of games. I mean, Manic Miner for the Amstrad. He worked with System 3 on Myth. And of course, for you... I think definitely talking about Command and Conquer was a big I, th- I think I took over half the interview and I was just like, damn, be quiet, Command and Conquer. <laughs> and just like went <laughs> I into it. I just sat back to my microphone off. Yeah, went into it deep, like, because I'm a huge fan of strategy games and, and CNC for me was like groundbreaking, but also it was that point that strategy got online and got multiplayer. And, uh, you know, you, you were playing it before you had AI and stuff, but having that multiplayer aspect on there you know, local LAN as well was just absolutely fantastic. And um, in this in this clip, we talk about, um, you know, what it was like having the multiplayer experience, them playing multiplayer in the office, and also what it was like kind of programming that AI. Like there was different abilities to play as well. So you had, you know, selecting each side. It wasn't just one side versus an enemy. And also uh, multiplayer as well. Um, did you guys spend much time like playing land games together in the studio oh my god yeah every single night i remember the very first game we had and the only unit you could you could build was the rocket launcher guy the rocket guy and so of course you know we would be playing four player games where there's four guys each with 50 rocket guys so it kind of started there and we were like oh my god <laughs> what the potential of this thing is amazing being, I think being able to, it, it was kind of a double-edged sword, being able to play all of these units in multiplayer was great because you could balance the abilities by having a range of different people play them and get an idea for, you know, the relative sort of attack damage and defensive, you know, sort of statistics that they have. Uh, and that was definitely part of the balancing. It is a double-edged sword, though, because you also have to, balance the single player campaigns and you know generally speaking in those ga- in certainly in those days less so today obviously but back then the ai was pretty uh, pretty much scripted you know you would have triggers and then you would have basic behaviors so you know get in range of unit it will fire at you kind of thing maybe it will follow you 
And, you know, the the AI or the enemy attacks would basically follow along the same sort of thing where they were scripted. You know, it's like the enemy would build a bunch of units and then send them to your base, basically, and try and take out key buildings. And that's not really how a human plays at all. And so I think it was quite a difficult task for the game designers. And by the way, I don't take any credit for any of the design balance in the game. Uh, that was totally the design department and other people doing that. But yeah, I think it was a double-edged sword because yes, you can balance the units out for pure stats, but how you use the units is very different to how they appear to you when you're playing through a campaign. So it's quite challenging, I think. Yeah, I think you could have easily done like another two or three hours of the steam. Oh God, right. yeah, yeah. We, we, <laughs> we barely scratched the surface on that. I'm going to start a separate podcast just on Command and Conquer. <laughs> <laughs> the Command and Conquer hour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've got a few more to get through before we uh, wrap up and, uh, of course, get ready for the Christmas quiz. We'll need to uh, get our heads down revising for that next week. Uh, but for my last um, clip of the year, and obviously it's been really difficult choosing these because, you know, we've had so many amazing guests on. But for me, talking to Tony Warriner, um, the Revolution Software co-founder, was just amazing. Now, of course, famous for games like A Broken Sword. But for me, Beneath the Steel Sky. Mm was always one of my favourite point-and-click adventure games as a kid. And hearing the story about how that game went from concept and uh, the interesting kind of early days and the early ideas they had for Beneath the Steel Sky um, were really interesting to hear from Tony, so uh, have a listen. Uh, well, we were running out of money, basically, on the on the normal version. So Virgin said, oh, here's, here's what we can do. There's this thing called CD32 coming out. Why don't we do a voiced version for that? And, and here's the money that that will that will take you know here's an extra budget for that version so why don't we give you that money now to finish the floppy version and then when that's finished you'll get the completion bonus and you can spend the completion bonus on the cd32 version so it was like an accounting sleight of hand i mean why they couldn't just give us some more money i don't know but that's that's what they did so they they said basically you're not going to finish this game or we said we're not we're running out of money you know we, we can't we can't finish this so the the cd32 sleight of hand was how the game got finished and, th- and then it turned out to be fairly ins- and i think it was one of the it was one of the first ever voiced games and it was pretty expensive as well because there was so much text in it you know it wasn't like a, a shoot 'em up where someone says game over or whatever or get ready for level two there, there was however many thousand lines of dialogue in it so it turned out to be quite an expensive undertaking uh the recording itself was was in a is in someone's front room on on uh, a, a busy road in london it, it was a disaster because every time every time that the, the bus went past or a lorry you could actually hear it on the first recording so uh, <laughs> wow <laughs> they, they, they had to send it the whole thing got sent back and they and re-recorded again so it was a complete shambles uh, a disaster really <laughs> But no, no one had ever done it before. I mean, we'd never been in, in, a, in a recording studio or, or knew what what was the way to do it or how to organise such a thing, you know. So it, it was a total farce. Uh, somehow we got away with it. Uh, but it and I think as well, the, the fact that, you know, you actually had actors doing it, because I know a lot, of, a lot of times back then, you know, even like four motion video games, they'd often just get, you know, staff from around the office or the programmers <laughs> to play the parts, wouldn't they? <laughs> programmer voices. Yeah, that, that would have been a lot even worse. That would have been really bad. Uh, it, it's not bad actually, is it? The final one. I mean, the voices no. the voices aren't bad at all. Apparently, um, Jason Isaacs is uh, one of the actors, um, right? Because if you look on Internet Movie Database, if you if you if you find Jason Isaacs, who's obviously a big star now, you, you scroll down to the very bottom of his of his uh, credited titles, you'll see Benny for Steel's guy there. Uh, and and someone pointed this out to me, and I was like surely not went and had a look and saw it and i was like wow i didn't know that so i wrote to him on uh, instagram saying hey uh, jason you, you don't know me but uh, you started in our video game back in the early 90s do you remember it um but he hasn't replied now for our next one joe um there are certain interviews where i think it's fair to say you kind of go on um full-on fanboy mode <laughs> oh yeah you definitely did for this one. Oh yeah absolutely um, so this is a guy, um, we, we were trying to get on for the entire lifespan of the, uh, the retro hour, James Rolfe, AKA angry video game nerd. You know, he, he's always been like, he's never ignored us or anything like that. He's always messaged us back whenever we've reached out and he's, you know, he's a busy guy, you know, he's a big YouTuber. He works on a lot of other projects and stuff like that. 
Um, but to finally be able to April this year sit down for him with an for an hour, you know, and just talk to him, just have a chat with him, and it. it, it I've been following AVGN since like 2007. You know, he was kind of part of the reason why I got back into going to car boot sales and, you know, buying retro games and stuff like that. And it was a really weird experience because it kind of felt like sitting down with an old friend as well. Like as starstruck as I was and giddy as I was about it, it was just like talking to our mate. You know, he was really relaxed and it was really cool and just kind of talking about, you know, he, you know, Dan always mentions like his wilderness of, from gaming years, you know, like when you were at uni, he kind of talked about that as well, like in the mid nineties, you know, where, you know, he was kind of waiting for the ultra at 64, you know, obviously now known as the N64 and his thoughts on the PlayStation. And I thought it was really funny how like he thought the PlayStation was going to be a flop and it was just going to be like the next CDI or 3DO, like another one of these like futuristic gray consoles, which, you know, plays <laughs> discs and it's just going to be boring and he's just going to wait for the N64 and how he had those couple of years where he was kind of stuck with his SNES and then all of a sudden he kind of jumped to GameCube while he was at university and college and stuff. And then kind of how AVGN kind of started to grow from there and that's how he kind of got back into it and stuff. So it was it was just fun to sit down with him. And like I say, it was like talking to my friend because Dan's kind of told me his story about that. So then to hear that from James Rolfe was just really, really fun. And it was just a huge highlight for not just the year, but kind of like for, for my career, if you will, with the podcast. You know, my time with the podcast, just to have him on was just really awesome. Some of them I heard about at the time and others I didn't, like the, the Philips CDI, I never heard of that one until later, but uh, I did hear of the uh, the real 3DO, the Panasonic 3DO. So that when, uh, when the Sony PlayStation came along, I thought it would just be another one of those. So that's why I, I didn't really expect the PlayStation to to be such a big deal because I was saving up for the N64 and uh, I had a friend who had a PlayStation and uh, it looked great, but I had a, a long way uh, to go uh, to wait for the N64. And it seemed like in that delay, um, I might have, might as well have gotten a PlayStation at the time, but that's just how it was. Yeah, so remember the N64, it was delayed by, you know, it probably in hindsight, it was only like 18 months, but as a kid, it felt like years. It did. You know, <laughs> waiting for that machine to come out. Yeah, like it probably wasn't actually as long, but it, it felt that way. But uh, I just remember waiting for that when it was called the Ultra 64. Mm. And um, the launch title I was most excited for was Killer Instinct, but that didn't even become a launch title by the time it came out. They had Killer Instinct Gold, the sequel. Uh, I think by that point, PlayStation had already uh, got enough traction and took over. Yeah, in hindsight, I, I, that's just how I sort of missed the whole... Uh, playstation thing i mean i played some of it i played some of the first couple resident evils when they came out i played Mm. twisted metal um but i didn't play uh metal gear solid or final fantasy 7 uh the games that like the major games that you hear about just went over my head Mm. and by that point i was um shortly after the n64 um i was busy with college and just didn't really play games as often well then then I started playing them a little more often cuz I had friends in college but we would play uh like we would play GameCube yeah. when that came out uh, usually more co-op or or competitive games like one of the Bond games uh Nightfire more like party games we would play yeah, yeah drinking games yeah yeah <laughs> Because you know that whole era as well when, you know, everything went kind of 3D. That was, you know, every game had to be made into 3D from like 1995 onwards. What did you feel about that at the time then? Did you kind of think it was, you know, were you impressed and thought this is going to be the future of gaming? Or uh, Because I know a lot of of games didn't really do that transition all that well, did they? I mean, famously stuff like, you know, Bubsy 3D and stuff that was (laughs) tried to be forced into 3D that was terrible. What what did you think of it when you saw 3D gaming? Yeah, yeah. I mean, looking back, there's a lot of crap, I guess. But but when I, uh, at at the time, I remember... uh, I remember Mario 64 feeling really cool. Like that was really awesome that you could run in a circle and it felt smooth. The joystick on the controller was, you know, was was responsive and it felt, yeah, it felt like the future. So I, I think I was impressed at the time. But I, I, uh, I guess fortunately I skipped over Bubsy and a lot of those type of games. Sony, the people who make Walkmans, who would have thought they'd make a games console? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it kind of comes back to that Microsoft, you know, with the Xbox, I guess. Yeah. You know, I was a bit young at the time, but I guess that's what people felt like, you know, oh, the TV company, the Walkman company. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we heard it from the Oliver Twins that they were trying to make games for the PlayStation and the industry. A lot of them were like, oh, yeah, you know, that's never going to be a success. Yeah. You want to make games for like, you know, the Sega Saturn or something instead. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. Inch- 
interesting to listen back. So yeah, having James Rolfe on, yeah, that was really one of the most fun episodes I think we've done this year. And uh, I can't believe that we're almost at the end then, but there is still one more. And uh, this guy was such a superstar. And again, I mean, we, ha- we have certain people on the podcast who really changed the industry. And uh, what our next guest did for the video industry and video graphics and uh, the Amiga as well. I mean, made that the, the Amiga probably the, the most successful that it ever was in North America in particular. And that was Tim Jennison. Yeah. So, you know, in our tagline, we have a uh, retro technology as well as video games. And I think this one is really interesting because it is just focused on that kind of retro technology. Um, but it's, it's through a, a machine, the Amiga and, mind-blowing uh, piece of technology that was invented and uh, Tim Jennison ran new tech who is still running today still absolutely pirate pioneering even though Amiga completely collapsed and <laughs> fell to bits and uh, it's testament to their kind of you know the product that they were creating and uh, the TV industry were absolutely blown away by this product it was a cheap way of doing video editing so it's looking back at those days of kind of video editing but also how they got major shows on board and how the company actually supported them. So um, here's a clip where he talks about Babylon 5, which was a famous sci-fi TV t- show where they kind of used Amigas to uh, render the intros and a lot of the CGI graphics. Anyway, so Ron had been uh, pitching this show called Babylon 5, and he the concept was that he would use Lightwave, and he sent us a diskette in the in the mail we put it in the amiga popped it up on the screen and here is the babylon 5 ship and it's gorgeous uh ron said our producer would like to meet with you guys to discuss the project so doug netter was the big money man and he just wanted to know that we would support the team you know uh throughout the uh, any any problems and we promised to do that and almost immediately, Ron was running into trouble. Uh, there was uh, motion aliasing. So this, with this Babylon ship, there were tiny pinpoints of light that were the portholes of the ship. And that's kind of the worst case scenario for aliasing because as, sh- as soon as the ship started to move, these lights would fluctuate. And um, we, you know, you have to do what's called anti-aliasing to get rid of that. And our anti-aliasing was not good enough at that point. So we sent the programmers into the back room to fix the aliasing. Uh, another early customer was Todd Rundgren, the rock musician, who had been a video guy for a long, long time. He had a video studio in, uh, in Woodstock, New York. Well, we were at a Mac show in uh, San Francisco uh, showing the video toaster. And I saw this tall, long-haired person across the room. And I go, that's Todd Rundgren. He's got this unmistakable forehead. Uh, and that's Todd Rundgren's forehead walking across the room. He, and he gets closer and closer and closer and closer. And he walks right up to me. And he says, what's this? He says, the video toaster. And I, I knew Todd was video savvy. So I immediately went into video jargon speak and told him that um, it was... Uh, a character generator, a still store, a 3D animation system, a video switcher, special effects generator, etc. I went down the list and I said, each one of these stations around our booth, uh, you can you can get a demonstration of each each part of the toaster. He said, great, thanks. And he disappeared. The next morning we came in to open up the booth and Todd is there before the show opened. He's been there all night, I guess because you don't kick Todd Rungren out. And he'd been there all night and had learned the whole thing. And he said, I'm going to need like a half a dozen of these. I said, okay, thank you. (laughs) And uh, then Todd started sending us, well, we didn't have email. He would send us faxes. This is early days. Fax machines. Look it up. And he he would say, uh, you know, this this doesn't work the way it should. Um, I'm having trouble with this. Uh, The program crashes when I do this. And he was just like the beta tester from hell. In a good way, you know, because uh, the programmers all wanted to make Todd happy. So the, you know, all these things sort of drove uh, drove the development of a, a Lightwave 3D and made it ready for prime time. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I remember seeing a, a demo with the video toaster on Bad Influence on TV. 
And Andy Crane being like, you know, this is running on the Amiga, you know, that thing that you play games on in your bedroom, um, really changed the whole face of desktop video, didn't it? Oh, so, yeah. And then the, stuff, the stuff that video. came out of that, like Lightwave and, you know, mm. a lot of the technologies, uh, the, the TriCaster for streaming and stuff now, it's, it's just mind-blowing. Yeah, so um, those are some of our highlights. I mean, it has been an incredible year for this podcast. And again, if you know, you've got a bit of time off over Christmas, maybe you missed some of those interviews, um, definitely worth a listen. And I'll link up the full episodes in the show notes, or you can head to our website at theretrohour.com. Have a little scroll back at um, what has been an amazing year for this show. Now, just before we wrap things up, um, let's give a massive thank you to the people who make it possible to bring the Retro Hour podcast to you every single Friday. And that is our incredible patrons community. And actually, this coming Sunday, cheesy Christmas jumpers at the ready and uh, maybe a, a glass of something slightly spicy because it is going to be our patrons Christmas party on Sunday night. We're going to play Pass the Parcel. <laughs> Virtual Pass the Parcel. <laughs> Virtual Pass the Parcel. I don't know how we're going to do that, Ravi. <laughs> I might look for some kind of game that we could all play. Maybe that could That's a good idea. Interesting. Yeah, like yeah. a group one. Yeah, that could be fun. Um, I really enjoy those those patron meetups and chats. And uh, I think the Christmas one's going to be very special. You know, it's crazy because um, we've done these patron hangouts on the last Sunday of the month. Um, usually, obviously, we've changed it because uh, Christmas Day is the last Sunday of the month this month. Um, but we've done them for coming up on like what must be about two years now. And they just seem to get busier and busier every time we do them. It's like the amount of new people that we've been seeing recently on there. Um, it's always amazing to welcome new people into the community. And of course, I feel like we've made some good friends on there as well. Oh, yeah. People that are yeah. there week after week. So, I'd love um, to get the uh, patrons more involved in the show as well. That, that, that could be something that we do going forward in the future. Yeah, so we've got big plans for 2023 and our patrons community. And if you'd like to join, um, not only do you get uh, invited to the the Christmas party that's coming up on Sunday this weekend, um, you can also unlock at 30 episodes of our patrons' exclusive show, The Retro Hour After Hours, where in the current one, it's a nearly a two-hour blockbuster of an episode <laughs> uh, talking about our uh, favourite arcade games. So that is available now if you need some extra listening over Christmas. And of course, for joining us on Patreon, you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, and that is the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame! <laughs> and let's induct our latest members into the Hall of Fame. A massive thank you to Stephen Foster. Craig T. Matthew. Retro Jerry. And Frank Kuistra. Who all joined us on Patreon over the last couple of weeks. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to join the Retro Hour patrons community, all the details are at theretrohour.com. So that is it for another year of this podcast as we look forward to 2023, but there is still one more episode to drop. Are you ready, guys? Are you ready to go home and cry to your mothers after you get destroyed <laughs> by, <laughs> by oh, me and my, my special guest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's on now. It's on now. So next week it is going to be uh, me and Joe versus Ravi and a uh, mystery guest who he's bringing on board to uh, try and claim the uh, title of the <laughs> Retro Hour Christmas. <laughs> Are you going to do it? For, this will be the first time. I would like you to get a win, honestly. I'm kind of on your side, Ravi. I think it would be nice if you... Oh, man, you is this going to be three against one? Like, Dan just <laughs> gets stuff wrong. <laughs> I'll be messaging now, him on the side. Now, now, if I'm abysmal next week and I lose, Joe, that can be my excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. You know, just cover and and who have we got at the hosts as well? We should uh, mention Paul Jury as well from Retro Gamer. We've got Oliver Wilmart as well, who is a expert quiz master who's been running his own uh, retro quiz for quite a while. So I expect the questions are going to be very varied. Paul's even been yeah. saying he's going to send us hints and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, parts of the question, it'll, it, it, it sounds very interesting and very complex. Just the kind of thing we love. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is going to be coming up next week. So uh, get your mince pies ready and your Neff Christmas jumpers on for our Christmas special. And uh, all that remains for us to say um, in the meantime is thank you so much for your continued support. Thank you for listening to this podcast every single Friday. And Merry Christmas. Bring Merry on Christmas. 2023. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs>